Hello and welcome to Five Favourite Books with me, Bella Debrera. I'm delighted to welcome back Greg Sheridan, foreign affairs journalist and commentator for uh, a penultimate discussion of one of his favourite books, which is a book called Leave It to Smith by P.G. Woodhouse. Welcome back, Greg. Thank you again for, for joining me on this uh, grey Monday afternoon. Great to be with you, Bella. And what, what, a, what a wonderful subject to discuss. The great master. It really master. is. Um, he is a master. Now, usually we have a little bit of a um, discussion about what the plot entails, but I think it's almost impossible with this <laughs> book. <laughs> well, it might, it might be worth starting out with, with who is P.G. Wodehouse. The correct pronunciation is Woodhouse, but I grew up with him in my head as Wodehouse, so I can't change. But um, So I, I think P.G. Wodehouse is the, the most gifted English prose stylist that I've ever read in any century. And it's a good joke by God to grant the writer the greatest gift who is going to purvey that gift only in light comedy. So Wodehouse wrote, they say 90 books, I think it's nearer to 100, and I think I have them all. And um, he he started out writing earnest public schoolboy adventures, and but discovered that he just had a talent for this um, in, in san, insanity, uh, this comedy of insanity, really. Although having said that, it's it's always very believable in its way. And he created great uh, fictional characters who have lived forever, notably Bertie Wooster mm. and his valet Jeeves and Lord Emsworth of Blanding's Castle and um, the oldest member who narrates all the golf, golf stories. And he, he sold millions and millions and millions of copies. He was also a very successful um, uh, lyricist for New York Broadway musicals and so on. And uh, he just makes... Uh, um, a hilarious account of sort of upper-class English Edwardian life. And um, it's not nasty, but it's very, very funny. And the genius lies entirely in the use of language. Although his books, his comic novels, are very intricately plotted. If you tried to summarise the plot of Leave it to Smith you'd have to have an Einstein-like equation of all the people who are who are pretending to be somebody else and imposters and secretly in love with somebody else and all the rest of it. And indeed, his books sell tremendously well in translation where a lot of countries read them for, for the plots. Of course, you can't read them for the language in, you know, Danish or Swedish or, or, or Japanese or something. And, and leave it to Smith, um, I chose as my favourite word house because it, uh, the character Smith was when he declared, when Wodehouse declared himself to be a genius. Smith walked on the stage in the middle of one of Wodehouse's earnest public school stories, and all of a sudden, the universe was transformed. Smith is this, is this supercilious, hilarious, brilliant, mad uh, character who is languid and elegant and... Um, who loses, you know, his family loses all his money and so on. And, the, and he wrote four Smith novels, and they're all about Smith trying to deal with the straightened circumstances of his uh, of his um, of his family. But Smith transformed all of a sudden. Wodehouse became a comic genius when Smith arrived. And this particular book, Leave It to Smith, is the fourth and last of the Smith novels, and the second of the Emsworth Blanding's Castle novels. And of course, it sold millions and millions of copies and is still in print today. Uh, you mentioned that this was his sort of comic, this was his, was Smith walking onto the stage, was the was the sort of announcement of Woodhouse's genius. I think Evelyn Waugh said, said much the same thing, if I'm not mistaken. And it's interesting because we were talking about Evelyn Waugh last week, so there's a nice continuity between our conversation about war and, and, and Woodhouse, obviously completely different <laughs> in their approach to literature, but but nonetheless... It's a, it's a nice it's, it's nice continuity I think um, this I was actually interested uh, to know why you chose leave it to Smith over a over a Bertie Wooster Jeeves um, novel but I can see now why because I because I've read it and I and it's so hard not to laugh out loud at something in every page of this book and that's and right it's just the language is an absolute delight like like um, you know I, I I was trying to trying to find the quotes that I wanted to sort of read out in this podcast and there were so many that I had to narrow it down to two but we'll do that we'll have a quote off later on we'll, we'll compare which ones we think are the funniest but um but Woodhouse was was a genius and 
um, th- it's interesting to 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 read about his his life. It's just as interesting to talk about the characters in 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 Smith. But actually, no, sorry, get that gets me to my point. What I wanted to say earlier is that Smith was based on a real character. He was based on um, Dolly Cart, Cart, Rupert Dolly yeah. Cart. Who, um, so Wodehouse says, yeah. So Wodehouse says, Woodhouse. Oh, you're making me say it the wrong way now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, just before I respond to that, l- let me take you up on that marvellous point you made about Evelyn War. All the, all the authors that we love in Britain in the 20th century regarded Wodehouse as the supreme genius. So Hilaire Belloc said that Wodehouse was the finest writer in the English language, which is a very big claim for Belloc to make. Chesterton loved Wodehouse. Orwell and War, mm. from their opposite political points of view, thought Wodehouse was a genius. Uh, uh, War said that Wodehouse cre- recreated the Garden of Eden. There had been no Aboriginal fall in in Wodehouse's mm. world. The original sin had not been committed, you know, and this was a garden of delight that we could all live in and delight mm. in. And there is a certain psychological theory about Wodehouse. You know, he was sent home. His, his parents were in Hong Kong. And he was sent home and boarded with various aunts and uncles and went to boarding school and so on. And he says he had a happy childhood, but there is a sense that maybe he just, from a very early age, decided to create this wonderful, fabulous, beautiful world. And he would never, never get involved in anything unpleasant or nasty in his life, although he's a very clever commercial writer. But Malcolm Muggeridge, George Orwell, as I say, they were devoted Wodehouse readers. All the politicians we like, Tony Blair, Boris Johnson, you can hear Wodehouse in every sentence that Johnson utters. And as a deep Wodehouse addict myself, I think I can tell you when when someone is a Wodehouse mm. person by the way they write. I mean, the, the Australian writer, um, ABC journalist Richard Glover, wrote a lovely memoir, um, Flesh Wounds, about his own early life. Very a beautiful book. And he says, you know, at this stage of my life, I achieved nothing except to read my own body weight in Dorothy L. Sayers' books. Now, that is that is a pure Wodehouse locution, you know, to read my own body weight in um, uh, in, uh, in, um, in in Dorothy L. Sayers. Now, you say um, Smith was the one who was given based on a real person. Wodehouse said that, and of course, Wodehouse... He was always performing. He wasn't a liar or anything. He was a very mm. honest man. Nobody ever, he, he didn't double deal or anything like that. He hardly ever had a dispute in his whole life. But um, he tried to help a, an impecunious friend by publishing their correspondence. And um, Bill Townend, a very unsuccessful writer. And his correspondence about the correspondence is wonderfully revealing because he says, Bill, we mustn't be confined to what we actually wrote to each other. We can improve these letters, you know, uh, make them much funnier and much more dramatic and so on. And as I say, he claims that Smith was loosely based on Rupert uh, Doyle Cart, but um, I think it was just the flowering of Wodehouse's genius. And there have been a lot of film and television adaptations of Wodehouse. They're all good fun. But none of them is is uh, that satisfying to a real Wodehouse addict because the genius is in the language and uh, you can construct the plots and the comic situations, but you can never replicate this language. And most of it is not even dialogue, although he was a great writer of dialogue, like Evelyn Waugh, one of the great writers of dialogue. But most of the genius is not even in, in the things they say, but just in the, in the reflections of Bertie Wooster or the comments that... Uh, that Wodehouse makes as the authorial voice, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, he really is the king of the king of similes, isn't he? He's just, uh, it's just, and he loves comparing people to the natural world. And um, there's this idea. Oh of, yes, um, absolutely. Well, um, War said, in fact, that uh, you have to regard a man as a genius who can produce three completely original similes mm. per page. You know, but uh, is it is it too early in our discussion for me to give you just a couple of his? Uh, no, his, I think we um, should go straight. Let's dive right in. So these are not all from Leave It to Smith, um, but uh, in in The Rummy Affair of Old Biffy, uh, in, in the volume Carry On Jeeves, he writes about Honoria Glossop. So Bertie Wooster was always scared of women and, mm. um, and both his aunts and yes. his contemporaries, you know. So Bertie's thought of Honoria, Honoria Glossop, 
Honoria Glossop is one of those robust, dynamic girls with the muscles of a welterweight and a laugh like a squadron of cavalry charging <laughs> over a tin bridge. And really, this is no one else could have written that sentence in the English language except uh, except Wodehouse. And then he's describing someone uh, who is tall and slim, and he says, "Nature, stretching Horace Davenport out." had forgotten to stretch him sideways. <laughs> and one could have pictured Euclid, had they met him, nudging a friend and saying, don't look now, but this chap coming along illustrates what I was telling you about a straight line <laughs> having length without breadth. And really, it's these absolutely are just... Brilliant. Uh, yeah, no, no one else in, in English literature um, uh, could, could have written these sorts of things. Uh, Bertie Wooster was always... Um, uh, scared that someone would trap him into marriage. And mm. um, and he, he wrote in Jeeves and the Feudal Spirit, I have made rather a close study of the married state, and I know what happens when one turtle dove gets the goods on the other turtle dove. Bingo Little has often told me that if Mrs Bingo had managed to get him on some of the things that it seemed likely she was going to get, the moon would have turned to blood and civilization been shaken mm. to its foundations. I have heard much the same thing from other husbands of my acquaintance, and of course similar upheavals occur when it is the little woman who is caught bending, and and so on. I mean, exaggeration is is a big part of this, um, a big part of the success of this uh, of this imagery, of course. These imageries have actually caught me <clears throat> caught me on public transport laughing out loud, and you know the usual thing of people looking at you to see what you're laughing at. I wish I'd known that that we were going to be finding quotes from Jeeves and Worcester, but I do have. Um, <laughs> one where I think this is from this is from Jeeves and Worcester. Um, she looked like a tomato struggling for self-expression. <laughs> Isn't that and great? And this is from this is from our, our book Leave It to Smith. A depressing misty scent pervaded the place, as if cheese had recently died therein. Painful circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great? Isn't that great? So the imagery is astounding, and yeah. then of course sometimes he will work up to a joke too. And he'll give you a joke. So in The Code of the Woosters, one of his funniest novels, he, he writes about Roderick Spode, who is based on Oswald Mosley, the British fascist leader, and gets elevated to the peerage and becomes Lord Sidcup, all these wonderful Wodehouse mm. names. And he says, Spode's, Spode is one of those silver-tongued orators you read about. Extraordinary gift of the gab he has. He could get into Parliament without straining a sinew. Then why doesn't he? He's a lord. Don't they allow lords in? No, they don't. I see, I said, rather impressed by this proof that the House of Commons drew the line somewhere. And, uh, <laughs> and it's, it's all kind of harmless. He's not really attacking lords or anything. No. In, in Leave it to Smith, one of the characters is a, is a typically odious, pretentious poet. And Wodehouse was not very kind to poets. You know, he liked rugger buggers and uh, uh, fellows who boxed at Oxford and, and mm. so forth and cricketers above all else. And um, and uh, the, the poet is a pretentious Canadian named Ralston McTodd. And for reasons wonderfully complex in the plot, Smith impersonates Ralston McTodd on a visit to um, Blanding's Castle. And on the train on the way up to Blanding's Castle, he reads through Todd's execrable poetry mm. and he comes across one line across the pale parabola of joy and he thinks to himself what on earth could that be uh, smith knitted his brow it was just the sort of line which was likely to have puzzled his patroness lady constance and he anticipated that she would come to him directly he arrived and ask for an explanation. It would obviously be a poor start for his visit to confess that he had no theory as to its meaning himself. He tried it again, across the pale <laughs> parabola of joy. And when I first read that, I was recalled, um, you know, that great Ern Malley skit, in a, uh, that great Ern Malley hoax, the wonderful episode in the history of Australian poetry, where um, James Macaulay and Harold Stewart uh, chose phrases almost at random from various army journals and, you know, cobbled them together and made out that they were the poems of a dead soldier called Ern Malley, whose sister sent them into the modernist mm. journal of verse, um, The Angry Penguins or something, uh, edited by Max Harris. And Max Harris was so bowled over by them, he devoted a whole issue uh, of his journal to this ridiculous uh, nonsense verse. 
And it, it contained the classic line, the darkening ecliptic, which of course is completely meaningless. Yeah. Yes. And uh, I thought across the pale parabola yes. of joy is a fair <laughs> equivalent to the darkening ecliptic, really. So it was like a, an early grievance hoax studies. Do you remember that? The um, Yeah, the, absolutely. The, the, yeah. The mock journal articles of last year that the, the sort of taking the Mickey out of this sort of the postmodernism. Sa- same a- absolutely. idea. Absolutely, mm. absolutely, a very successful mm. uh, hoax. I mean, terribly embarrassing for poor old Max Harris, but very, very funny. His defence was that Stuart and Macaulay were themselves really gifted poets. So, so they'd so managed that, to put some decent poetry together from the random words. Yeah, but that it was a pretty, pretty thin defence. Yeah. In one of um, uh, Wodehouse is always. Uh, mocking pretentiousness and he has um he has a chronically unemployed young fellow rock metaler todd trying to become a poet once and and his verse is unbelievably terrible (laughs) and in one of the golf stories he had many many golf stories and the hero is always a fellow with a name like beefy bingham or something yes and and he's trying to get the girl but above all he's trying to get his handicap down to zero or trying (laughs) to win the trophy or something and the villain is always some suave, sophisticated art poseur, in that case, Rodney Spelvin, and mm. Wodehouse was a genius for these names. And Rodney Spelvin, uh, two pieces of his work recommend themselves to me. Rodney Spelvin once burnt something that he'd written in the fireplace and, uh, and Beefy or whoever comes into the room and he says, I could smell at once the acrid stench of burnt poetry. <laughs> and... <laughs> And Rodney Spelvin is a great one for the ladies, and he's always trying to um, seduce them. And so he writes this terrible uh, volume of verse and dedicates it to one who will know who she is. And then every girl he ever meets whom he's met previously, he says, of course, you saw the dedication in my book, didn't you? And uh, and each, each girl swoons thinking that this great poet has dedicated this book to her out of his secret love and so on. This is a typical Wodehouse, uh, Wodehouse construct. It's very, he's, he's, he's very, very funny. And actually, he, he um, attributes a quote to, to, to Smith in the conversation about poets. He says... We must always remember, however, said Pith, said Smith, that poets are also God's creatures. <laughs> that's right. Yes, <laughs> that's right. He, um, it's very hard to analyse the genius in Wodehouse's prose, but very often it's this perfect ability to adopt a certain tone in a sentence and then to completely lampoon the tone with the last, the last part of the sentence. So... In one of the introductions to his golf stories, he is um, he is commenting about how influenced he's been by the great Russian novelists and their existential struggles with life and death. You know, mm. so his not his volumes about golf and so on are influenced mm. by Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. <laughs> and uh, he says, you know, a man is beset by these terrible burdens, and uh, despite his early promise. As he progresses through the torture and agony of life, he finds in the end that his whole existence has been a complete washout. And these words, a complete washout, this sort of slang, this insertion of Edwardian (laughs) slang into what is a ludicrously pompous sentence, (laughs) just somehow or other it's that that marriage of those two idioms that that often creates the... um, the humorous effect, I think. I, I don't think anyone else has done it that quite that brilliantly. Um, no. It would be in- interesting to talk about, you know, most listeners will probably have an idea about Woodhouse's brush with the Germans in, in the Second World War, the famous episode of his... Um, his uh, what, were, what were they? They were Broadcasts. Uh, broadcasts. I think he did right. five or five or six he did. or something like that. So um, this was... Do you want to tell us a little bit about about what happened to him in the Second World War? Yeah, this was the most traumatic episode of Wodehouse's <laughs> life and one where he showed very poor judgment. Um, but he was completely innocent. And uh, wonderfully, the intelligence officer who was sent to investigate him after the Second World War was Malcolm Muggeridge, who, who wrote that Wodehouse was not only innocent, he was a kind of definition of innocence. Mm. But Wodehouse was an honourable, good nice guy you know he married he he had one wife and she had a daughter from a previous marriage and he became a very devoted stepfather and 
He never cheated anybody. He gave lots of money to friends who were hard up, you know, much to the distress of his wife, who was always objecting to it. So he'd secretly give the money, which is often a plot device yes, in his novels as well. Yes, I recognise that. But one good thing about him was, and this is true of the greatest writers in literature, he wrote initially because he needed the money. And he was always very conscious of earning his living uh, by writing. And, um, of course, he became very rich because he became one of the best-selling authors in the world. But always he was he was uh, keen. He wrote huge amounts. He was very prolific. And always he was keen to earn his living. Now, he, from a very early stage, he spent a lot of time in America. As soon as he had enough money to pay his fare, he took a ship to New York and spent as long there as he could sold a lot of pieces but couldn't really make a regular living in New York at that stage. But when he came back to London, he then wrote a lot about America and he, he realised very early on that Americans loved to read what he wrote about England and that Englishmen loved to read both what he wrote about England but also what he wrote mm -hmm. about America. And in the First World War, he was in America when the First World War broke out and he spent the whole of the First World War there. He couldn't get into the army because of very poor eyesight. He would have been willing to do whatever whatever was expected of him. But then between the wars, he had a terrible tax problem. So the Americans wanted to tax him as a primarily American resident, which meant they wanted to tax his worldwide income. And the Brits wanted to tax him primarily as a British resident, which meant they wanted to tax his worldwide income. And if he'd let them both do that, he would have been paying much more tax than he earned in income. So he solved this dilemma by moving permanently to France so that his residence in reality and for taxation purposes, was France. And he always said all he needed in life was one wife, one friend, one dog and a typewriter. That was, uh, you know, in a pleasant garden to stroll in. And he was happily living in France. And when World War II broke out, the local British uh, consul general <coughs> advised British residents not to panic and not to flee because France wouldn't fall. So they should just stay and, mm. you know, go about their normal Life. So that's what he did. He just stayed and went about his normal life. And then um, he was rather naive and trusting of whatever officials told him. And then at the last minute, he and his wife decided they better leave when France was clearly falling and they couldn't get out. So they, they just stayed petrol. there. They ran out of petrol. Yeah. Their car broke down. They were trying to go to Portugal and get a plane. So a very Bertie Wooster sort of thing. Very you know, Bertie the car Wooster. didn't work. Yeah. And then the next, they borrowed a car from next door and it didn't work. So anyway, there they were in France when the Germans came along. He was then 58 or something. And after a couple of months, the Germans decided to inter all um, enemy, uh, you know, nationals in France. So he was sent to an internment camp with a lot of other English men. And he was a bit worried about what would happen to his wife. His wife stayed living at their home and she was OK. But other than that, he was kind of OK. In the first cell, there was only one bed. And it was four four blokes to a cell, and he wasn't the oldest bloke, so he slept on the floor, and the oldest guy got the bed. But later on, they were moved to more permanent quarters, and um, the uh, all the other prisoners loved him because he would spend all day. The Germans, succumbing to international pressure, let him have a typewriter, but they didn't give him any other benefits so he had the same rations as everybody else and all Presumably the rest of it. they gave him paper as well not just the yep, they gave him a typewriter <laughs> and paper and and all the other inmates loved him because he was such a positive friendly uh guy and of course what would you do in a german internment camp you'd write jeeves and bertie novels i mean naturally so he got two or naturally. three novels written at this time and he would read them out to the other inmates of a, of a night time and they would fall about laughing most of them knew his work anyway so they and then finally, when he turned 60, or when he was just about to turn 60, the Germans released him. But they took him straight to Berlin and put him in a hotel. Now, he'd had no news of the war up till that point. And um, I think it might have been in 1940 or 41, I guess. Um, and the um, local American broadcaster because America was still neutral in this at this stage said to him look would you like to do a broadcast to America and uh, he said well I'm not going to do anything political and they said no 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 just do whatever you like uh, just mm. do a broadcast and Wodehouse is thinking gosh they haven't heard from me for a few years I mean I hope my books are still selling so he did five funny broadcasts 
about being a prisoner in an internment camp. And later on, the BBC thought they were magnificent anti-German propaganda because they gently mocked the German guards and their obsessions with counting everything. And, you know, at one point in it, he says, if I ever get back home, I'm going to hire a German guard and constantly count him. I'm going to make him march up and down and I'm going to count him 28 times a day. And so there was not a speck of politics in the broadcast, Mm. but they were subsequently rebroadcast into Britain by the Germans, um, whereas Wodehouse initially thought he was broadcasting only Mm. to America. And naturally, they caused a great scandal in Britain because it looked as though he was giving aid and comfort to the enemy. Now, as soon as Wodehouse realised that anyone thought like that about him, he immediately refused to do any other broadcasts and he was sort of left alone most of the time. He spent a little bit of more time in internment and then when Paris was liberated, he was briefly interned by the liberating French forces and then they let him out again. And then, as I say, both MI6 and MI5 came and investigated him. And the, the, the odious Duff Cooper, who was the British immig- uh, information minister, launched this bizarre, ridiculous attack on him on on the air as though Wodehouse were a great um, traitor. And so he was attacked by a few, you know, very nationalist folks on the BBC. And as a result, he never returned to Britain. So his last visit to Britain was in 1939 to receive an honorary doctorate of letters from Oxford University. And eventually, when everything was cleared up, he went to America So he was cleared by MI5 and cleared by MI6, but it wasn't absolutely certain there wouldn't be some crazy prosecution when he got back to Britain, although all of his defenders came out, you know, and what magnificent defenders he had, George Orwell, Malcolm Muggeridge, Evelyn Waugh, all of them saying, don't be so ridiculous, you idiotic politicians, you're not going to deprive us of our glorious PG Wodehouse. But he said later in his autobiography, he realised it was a very stupid thing to do. There was no malice in it. He wasn't mm. a, you know, he wasn't a traitor or anything like that. Uh, Orwell argued that he was completely innocent of politics. And I think Orwell was slightly wrong there because he did write one political novel, Wodehouse, The Code of the Woosters, which was a send up of um, Oswald Mosley and British fascists. In this Code of the Woosters, uh, the Oswald Mosley character, Lord, Lord Sidcup, Roderick Spode, is trying to create a black shirts movement, but all the black shirts have been bought so he, he buys black shorts instead and creates a black yeah. shorts movement. A very typical <laughs> Wodehouse uh, sort of... Uh, and, and Bertie at one point denounces him. You know, he says, if you think, Spode, that getting a bunch of overweight, beefy fellows perishing around the <laughs> oval in their footer bags makes you some kind of emperor, you know, a, a, a typical sort of... That's as near as Wodehouse ever got to, uh, to a political denunciation. So do you, do you think that um, Woodhouse influenced your your writing? Do you think it's influenced your style in any way? I do. And so obviously I don't have one millionth of one percent of Wodehouse's talent. But I think if I had to say which writer had influenced my whole life more than any other, I'd say it was Wodehouse. Not only my writing, but also my attitude to life. Now that in a sense, is an inherently ridiculous thing to say. And Wodehouse himself would turn in his grave at being <laughs> at being given that. I think he influenced other writers. You can see mm. him in Evelyn Waugh. <clears throat> um, the, the beautiful Even, Evelyn Waugh novel, um, A Handful of Dust, mm. the comic stuff in the first half where, where the husband takes a, um, takes a waitress or something to the seaside and they have a fake affair to create fake evidence for a divorce, uh, Wodehouse himself said, this is real Mr. Mulliner mm. stuff. You know, one mm. of his, his comic characters was Mr. Mulliner. And War was certainly, you know, uh, War's sense of the ridiculous, which was very advanced, I'm sure was influenced by Wodehouse. But I think Wodehouse, first of all, he gives you a sense of the possibility of language. So he's described someone's hair as the brilliantine swamps of his forehead, mm. you know, and you can mm. just see a man with dark black hair yes. covered in, in the brill cream or, or whatever, yeah. you know. And uh, so, and he gives you outlandish metaphors and similes, you know. Um, uh, he also has a genius with the way he dismantles cliches and recruits them to his use. So there's some 
bulky woman in a golf story who said she could have knocked you could have knocked me down with a feather she said and he he writes this was plainly poldering with the truth <laughs> for feather was never plucked of bird that could have done any damage to yeah. that uh, that sturdy uh, woman so he takes the cliche and makes a joke but he also in a lot of the time war was writing uh, Wade House was writing the phrase peace and prosperity we're building a land of peace and prosperity so he would say you know, the man looked so forlorn, it was as though peace had been separated from prosperity mm. or something like this. But at a, at a deeper level, this sounds ridiculous, to say to say a sentence about Wodehouse which begins at a deeper level, nonetheless, I'm going to mm. open myself to a Rodney Spelvin-style moment. I think if you read enough Wodehouse, and people who love Wodehouse are complete addicts, so I collected all of his books as a teenager, and I think I've got them all. I might be missing one or two of the very first public school books, although I've got a lot of them, The Gold Bat and The Pot Hunters and so on. Um, there is an attitude to life, which is, uh, you know, it's not all that serious. You know, you can have a little laugh about it. You know, uh, uh, you know, something terrible had happened to Bertie and he'd say, you know, um, I was so afflicted that... Uh, or, or my aunt was so terrifying that it would have taken a till of the hun to stare her down. And even then, it would have had to be one of his best mornings, uh, that yeah. sort of thing, you know. And the, the whole of life in Wodehouse, as War says, there's a, there's a Garden of Eden innocence to it. Mm. And I think um, most of the people I know who are definitely Wodehouse uh, veterans, like Richard Glover, there is often a humour that runs through everything so and it fits very well with the irish attitude that the situation is desperate but not too serious mm. you know uh, and, and i think um it certainly influences your style because mm. the sense of irony and the sense of um having a joke uh, at yourself all the time you know uh, and the sense of what language can do is there but i actually also think eventually it permeates your attitude to the whole of life and wodehouse had a, a a wonderfully benign attitude to all of life. Nothing was ever... I mean, his two and a half years or whatever, however long it was in a German internment camp, I mean, a different sensibility would have turned those mm. into tragic novels of deprivation and despair and, you know, will I ever get out of this and uh, how is my family and so on. He wrote he wrote his Wooster and Jeeves novels. It's and, incredible. Uh, he certainly didn't play the victim, did he? No, he never played yeah. the victim. And so he had a really difficult childhood in the sense that he was brought back to England at a very young age and and then left with various unsympathetic aunts and uncles, went to a whole series of unsympathetic schools and then ultimately went to Dulwich College and he loved Dulwich College. And his account of his own childhood is that it was all a breeze, everyone was nice to him, he loved everything, loved playing rugby, loved playing cricket, mm. loved Dulwich College and he remained very attached to it for the whole of his life. But it's almost compulsory for every other English writer I've ever read to lament the tortures they underwent at their public school. You know, even a writer as great as C.S. Lewis, whom I love and admire, his um, his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, he recounts how, how lonely and bitter mm. public boarding school, you know, these, these wealthy English schools were. And, you know, they'd get corporal punishment and other boys would rough them up and they miss their parents and you know there's a whole industry which says that the neglect of Winston Churchill by his mother led to his ultra belligerent spirit mm. but the way Wodehouse responded to it was just to create joy and happiness and order everywhere and his life was incredibly orderly he was the most disciplined writer in the world he was writing the lyrics of Broadway shows and he would stay till the interval on the first night and then go home because he had to go to bed because he had to get up early in the morning and, you know, do his five hours of writing every day. And nothing would disturb his routine. He was um, easygoing but ruthless about um, mm. about the demands of his craft. So you say you, you've got 100 of his books, you've got 90 to 100 of books. So you started reading when you were a teenager. How did you come across him? Was he given to you by someone else or...? What what were the how did you find Woodhouse? How did you discover Woodhouse? I think God gave him to me to tell you the truth. But I I would have probably even more than a hundred of his books. I think because Wade is a very tricky writer to know how many books he wrote because he was always giving 
a different title to a book as it was published in America, as it was published in England. So the first of the Blandings Castles books is called Something Fresh in England. It's called Something New in America. And he often published in America before he published in England because the market was so much bigger and they absolutely loved all of his treatment of Edwardian. Um, and then sometimes he would rewrite a book a little bit for the American market. And then sometimes as he was getting older, he'd just take a book he wrote 50 years ago, change the names, update it a bit, jazz it around and give it a new book. And this happened to me once. I, I read a book of his and I thought, that's incredibly similar to mm. something. Now, they, they had appeared 50 years apart, but I'd read them sort of within a couple of months. But so Wodehouse is the only author who stayed with me for my whole life who I actually began reading in pre-teen years. So like you, Bella, and I'm sure like, you know, many IPA uh, supporters, I was a very book-dominated kid. You know, books were my life. And um, when I was in about uh, fifth class, so I must have been about 10 or 11, uh, I went up to the Christian Brothers High School from the infants and primary school I'd been at with the nuns. And one of the great things about Christian Brothers High School at Lewisham was it had a fantastic library. And I began reading public school uh, schoolboy books. Uh, and, of course, the social setting is a million miles from my social mm. setting. I was a working-class Irish Catholic kid in the inner western suburbs of Sydney. So reading about grand English boarding schools yes. where everybody's father was a noble and they were all boarders in this house and that house and so on, it was very exotic. And I came upon Wodehouse's public school stories. So I was reading them, I think, the the, gold, the golden bat and the potholers and so on. They were often heavily around cricket, but they were also about pranks and playing up and uh, so they persecuting. they appealed to you as a boy. They appealed to you. The, the, Absolutely. They yeah. appealed to me as a yeah. boy. They were kind of a, a sub-Biggles genre. Yes. You know, only, yeah. only boys would read them. Yeah. Adventures on the cricket field, adventures yeah. on the rugby field, getting in scrapes, the headmaster giving you six... Mm. strokes with a cane, all that sort of stuff. Just what a 10 or 11-year-old would read, really. <laughs> and then in one of these, uh, in the best of the public school stories, uh, is called Mike. And um, it's, you know, it's about 700 pages long or something. It's probably published in serial installments. The first four or 500 pages, it's a conventional public school story. And the hero is Mike Jackson, who's a great cricketer and an all-round good guy, the sort of guy Wodehouse liked but didn't write about much because you can't get that kind of guy into too many mm. scrapes. And then uh, Mike's conduct and report card is quite bad, so his father takes him away from this great public school, Wirriken, and sends him, or Riken, I don't know how to pronounce it, sends him to a an out-of-the-way little place called Sedley, which is a, a modest school with only a couple of hundred uh, kids, but Jackson senior heard that it produced a Bailey Old scholarship or something like mm. this. And Smith um, is has suffers the same fate from his father. He, he'd been at Eton or something and he'd got into too much mischief, so his father sends him to Sedley. And Mike and Smith meet at, uh, at Sedley. Smith's name, of course, is spelled P-S-M-I-T-H because he's a regular Smith and he thinks it's too common. So he wants to make it different. And he doesn't like Smythe or Smithy or something. So he just turns it into P. Smith. And, of course, there are dozens of pages yeah. of humour where he's telling people that it's the P is silent as in ptarmigan or psychology and so on. You know. And the people, and then, are, they're always confused and they never understand it. It's, very, it's every six or seven pages where they have the same conversation. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, of course, funny. repetition is a brilliant part of yeah. Roadhouse's comedy. Yeah. So something comes back when you least expect it. But Smith then, in this public school story, Smith arrives as a completely formed comic character. And so he does to the housemasters at Sedley just what he does to Ralston McTodd and the mm. efficient Baxter and so on at Leave It to Smith. He's a, he's a model of anarchy. And, uh, and there are all these marvellous comic touches. You know, there's a, there's a sequence where he goes into a shed in the middle of the night for some you know, forbidden purpose to go out bicycling at, you know, midnight or something. And he spills red paint over his shoes. And the housemaster, who is his enemy, thinks that that's how he's going to get him. But Smith anticipates that, goes and hides the shoe, and then leads the housemaster on a thousand false trails to shoes 
which he also hides in places where the housemaster is going to find them, but they all don't have red paint on them. And the poor fellow is going mad. It's like the scene in Leave it to Smith, where his enemy, the efficient Baxter, Lord Emsworth's secretary, gets locked out in the middle of the night and can't get back in. And he knows that Smith has hidden the jewels in a pot plant, but Smith has taken the pot plant away. And so he ends up digging up all the pot plants around the place and he goes mad, you know. Mm. So Smith arrives in the middle and I was just turning probably 11 turning 12 or something when I read the Smith stuff and then all of a sudden that just opened a door for me into a different kind of writing and then I went after Wodehouse's other books and at first I couldn't believe it was the same guy I thought the cricket mm. stories were so serious and the Jeeves and Bertie stories were so funny how could it be the same man but you know of course you you grow up a bit and then you you see that one set of books were written for kids and one set of books were written for all human beings, you know. So why did you choose, I think I might have asked you this at the beginning, but why did you choose Leave It to Smith over over Jeeves and Worcester? Well, uh, Smith is my favourite Wodehouse character, even though he, um, he, this is his last book, he only does four, mm. four Smith novels. <clears throat> and, you know, this is terribly embarrassing, Bella. I apologise to everybody who might feel this is just tells them everything they never wanted to know about me. I, <laughs> I can't I wait really, to hear this. I really tried to model my speech and behaviour and so on on Smith for a little while, as did, did every you? young boy who ever read Smith, you know. So I became even more supercilious. Mind you, I was a chubby little fellow. I wasn't a, I wasn't a tall, <laughs> slender, good-looking uh, chap like Smith. But um, for a while, I was trying to speak emulate, with that same wit Smith. as Smith, you know, and it got me into a lot of grief with teachers and so forth, you know, and uh, Tell it me, takes did you, a long did you time. Purchase a, did you purchase a monocle or did you leave it? At I the... didn't, but I would have if, if you, I'd been able if to. They'd been around, if they'd been I on sale. A, I affected a walking stick for a little while, <laughs> you know, you? and uh, well, you know, you're very literal as an 11 year old, you know, and, uh, and it takes a while to master irony and so forth. So Smith was tremendously important to me. And I, I've reread all those four Smith novels again and again and again. I reread the school Smith novel um, only probably 12 months ago. And I inflicted, I made my poor sons read. Because they said, what's all this Wodehouse about? And I said, just read this one, the Smith. And um, they read it and said, yes, OK, that is funny. I can see what you're on mm. about, but I don't plan to read any more. You know, it just didn't oh. kind of... Uh, take with them and then the other thing is although I love Wodehouse absolutely love him I quite enjoy it when he occasionally lets a slightly just a marginally more serious um, theme emerge in his writing like the Code of the Woosters is mm. a send-up of of British fascism there's a wonderful short story Lord Emsworth and the Girlfriend in which um, one of the few occasions not the only occasion one of the few occasions where Wodehouse uh, demonstrates a kind of consciousness of the inequalities that the working class suffers. So Lord Emsworth is basically trying to be a good influence in a little girl's life who who, who is a working class little girl. And she's much tougher and smarter than he is. Mm, but yeah. Lord Emsworth actually, actually develops a bit of character, a bit of backbone. And every now and again, Smith will, uh, Wodehouse will, will just let a little of the melody of real life enter into his... Garden of Eden. And you get that in Leave it to Smith, because there's a real love story, Smith and Eve Halliday. There's another love story, really, between the two criminals, Aileen Peavy, who is only pretending to be mm. a dreadful, pretentious poetess, and the criminal she's uh, hooked up with, who also comes to Blanding's Castle trying to pretend to be Ralston McTodd. And um, it also shows you what Wodehouse might have done if he'd gone into the detective novel genre, which he well could have done. When Wodehouse, I think, was very lucky that his family ran out of money when he was about to go to university and he thought he was going to go to Oxford. He had, of course, good enough marks. You know, by the time he finished high school, he could write nonsense limericks in in ancient Greek and Latin. And you see it in the construction of his sentences. Sometimes there are so many subordinate clauses and, you know, uh, that was an out, outrage up with which I was not willing to put mm, and yes, that was a scandal yep. than which there can have been few more grave scandals. And then the sentences will have commas and so mm. on. Only someone skilled in Latin and Greek mm. really could do that. So Wodehouse had a great classical education, but then he didn't go to Oxford and become just a dull classic scholar or, or try to infuse his novels with artistic uh, 
pretentiousness. He had to earn his living, went to work for a bank, hated that, came home every night, wrote little bits and pieces for um, Fleet Street newspapers, got a novel published while he was at at, um, at the bank, got another novel published and decided he could actually make a living uh, out of his writing. So after two years in, in the bank, he became a full-time journalist and writer. And of course, he started out as a journalist. He was eight or nine years on the staff of a newspaper before he made enough money from his fictional writings. And that tremendous discipline, a, a lot of the greatest writers in literary history needed to make a quid out of their writing. And Wodehouse, um, Wodehouse had that to the to the highest extent. So um, Leave It to Smith is also a kind of transition novel. It's only the second time Blanding's Castle comes in. And then you can see him realising that Lord Emsworth and Aunt Constance and Beach the Butler and so on, they all have great potential. Every now and again, Jeeves and Bertie cross over with Blanding's. Not very often, uh, but just every every so often. So he'll, he'll mix up his universe uh, quite a bit. Smith lives in a different world from Emsworth and Bertie Wooster and so on. But this this novel is also fun because it mixes uh, mm. all those different... Um, and then finally, of course, it's quite subjective, just which thing strikes you as your favourite. Very hard to pick a favourite Wodehouse, though, because... There are just so many that are so great. So, would you recommend um, starting with Leave It to Smith or starting with a with a with a Jeeves and Worcester? If you were going to recommend someone who had never read Woodhouse before, well, I think Leave It to Smith is a good place to start because it works quite well as a conventional um, sort of detective novel and a conventional uh, romantic comedy. So, you've got romance. Eve Halliday is a, is really a a very nice girl, unlike Honoria Glossop and Hermione and all the rest of them, who and Madeline Bassett and all the legions of terrible women who try to ensnare Bertie Wooster yes, in, in matrimony. Yeah, <laughs> and, and even the nice ones are pretty rugged. Rosie M. Banks, who <laughs> who writes magazine articles about her husband, which makes him cringe with embarrassment, you know. And all of Wodehouse's legions of ferocious aunts, the you aunt, know, aunt, the aunt's just aunt hilarious. Agatha, who yes. could. Uh, who could open bottles with her eyes at 50 paces and who froze bats yep. and, you know, with her stare and so on. One nice aunt, Aunt Dahlia, but lots of uh, difficult aunts. So unlike all of those, Eve Halliday is a conventionally uh, very lovely girl who ultimately allows her heart to be won by Smith. So it, it gives you all the, all the stuff you need from a conventional novel, but it also can contains these absolute gems of uh, of comic writing like the send up of the of the poet and of course when Smith gets to Blandings the first thing someone asks him Aileen yeah. Peavy comes along and says could you tell me <laughs> what did right. you mean by across the pale parabola of joy and he says yes I did put a bit of leg spin on yes. that didn't I you know, it's a bit, <laughs> I love it goes past the face of the that. bat doesn't it you know and and the whole thing is is just screamingly funny. Now, I think funny. if you read... So with Anthony Powell's The Dance of the Music of Time, another of my favourite novels, I always say to people, read it through to the end of Volume 2. And if you still don't like it at the end of Volume 2, you, you, you're going to mm. hate it. Volume 1 is not so great. Volume 2 is screamingly funny. Uh, Wodehouse clearly influenced Anthony Powell too. You can see that very, very obviously. But with Leave it to Smith, I think if you read Leave it to Smith from start to finish and you don't like it, then probably you're not really a human being. But, uh, but in <laughs> fact, you're not going to like Wodehouse no matter what happens. Whereas if you have no prior exposure and you jump straight into the middle of uh, Jeeves and Bertie or Blanding's Castle, it may just be a, a slightly more mm. robust um, immersion. You know, you might think it's a bit, uh, a bit stranger. But uh, really, it's very hard for anybody to resist Wodehouse. Oberon War, who... You know, Oberon War took it as a matter of principle to disagree with his father about everything and to detest all of his father's friends. So he persecuted Anthony Powell and so on. But Oberon War, like his father, Evelyn War, loved P.G. Wodehouse. And I remember him commenting once, you cannot take a person seriously who is suffering depression or is otherwise unhappy with life, who has not at least tried to cheer themselves up by reading P.G. Wodehouse, you know, so it was only you, 
Oberon War would only take your despair seriously if you'd at least <laughs> tried five or six P.G. Wodehouse novels to cheer yourself up, you know. And indeed, you know, the last uh, six or seven years ago, I had nine or ten days in hospital, quite a, you know, straightforward but big operation. So the books I ended up taking into hospital to have as my companions were, of course, um, were, of course, Wodehouse. You know, mm. I took the Jeeves omnibus and... Um, and and the world of Smith, the four uh, the four Smith novels, and, and they uh, transported you to that idyllic idyllic world. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, not Why that not? I suffered any any great no. depression or trouble in hospital, but certainly the only horrible thing I saw in hospital was free to air daytime television. That was the <laughs> one horrific thing that I saw in hospital, and certainly it was preferable to switch that off and to just you know absolutely go into P. G. Wodehouse's uh, world. Um, well, that's so an think, excellent, excellent recommendation. I think so. I think we should, as a matter of welfare policy, we should, yes. as well as job keeper allowances and new start and everything, we should give, leave it to Smith or the Code of the Woosters or something like that or something fresh. The, or the, government, should the, send, the government should send out a free copy to everyone in lockdown to, as, as part of their, their mental Absolutely. health measures. Absolutely. Yeah. I was a correspondent in Beijing in 1985 and I took a great swag of Wodehouse novels with me. And um, there was some poor innocent Chinese citizen who was uh, designated as my interpreter and uh, fixer, but mm. whose real job was to spy on me, of course. And um, and she was trying to, you know, improve the quality of her English. And she asked if I had any novels that I could <laughs> lend or give to her. She would have been completely lost. So I, I feel I introduced, who knows what the consequences would be. I gave <laughs> six, six PG Wodehouse novels to the People's Republic of China, you know. <laughs> It hasn't so far resulted in a benign transformation of their political system, but still, it was something. You know? <laughs> well, that's that's an excellent note to finish on. You've done your bit for you've done your bit for the uh, for for the Chinese population with <laughs> P. G. Woodhouse. Um, I tried. I did. My you best. tried. That's, that's right. Absolutely wonderful. So thank you. I think we'll finish we'll finish on that very funny note. A very Wood Woodhouseian. Would it be Woodhouseian Woodhouse? I think so, note. yes. I think so. Note. In fact, note. I, I wrote a letter to my father at the time and I said, I have introduced um, I have introduced the joy the joy experienced by the many headed to the very many headed indeed. So a Wodehouse term for a lot of people was many many yes, headed. Many headed. And of course Chinese are very many headed because there are you know, there's one point four billion of them or something. But look, Bella, <laughs> thanks so much for what fun it is to spend fun. 45 minutes or an hour or whatever it is talking about P.G. Wodehouse. What I mean, fun. All, all this in heaven too, really. What more could <laughs> yes, you want? You know? Exactly. Thank you so much. It's been a joy. Thanks very much, Bella. Sign up today for only $55 and we'll also send you a free copy of the first book, The Year of Living Dangerously by Christopher Koch, which will be signed by Greg and myself. Plus, you'll also be invited to a very special online town hall event that we're having in August, where you can ask Greg any questions that you have about his choice of books. I'm so excited to be sharing this new series with you. For all the details, head to ipa.org.au.